and I'm starting to record because that's always usually the part that I forget. Um, so yes, we are, we're, we're fiddling around with new technology. We're trying to get a little more sophisticated so that we're sharing a better picture for those who are staying at home and uh, doing Zoom. Uh, thankfully, our, our new hire, Joey Martin, comes from a bit of an IT background, so he can bail us out when we're completely helpless. Um, Tech support. But if you do have questions, we'll try to monitor that in chat and uh, hopefully capture those at the end of the uh, segment. But uh, that being said, uh, I'll go ahead and, you know, <clears throat> Amy, Amy doesn't really need that much introduction. This is her, um, I actually calculated it. Oh my gosh. This is her 602nd day on the job. Um, Good She's math. still learning. But, <laughs> but we're happy to have her here. Um, she's brought great energy, um, as Joey is already, uh, to, the, to this crew here. Um, keeps us all honest. Um, not sitting on our laurels, so we keep chugging along. And uh, Amy is greatly, you know, uh, taking on uh, doing another segment for our Tuesday gardening series. So she's going to talk about sustainable gardening practices. Um, she's always looking for that sustainable edge. Uh, she nags me when I have to when we plant things, and she goes, "Are we going to have to dig this up later on?" Yeah. <laughs> and I get it. Um, but she, she's got a great eye on being sustainable and you know things that we can do to be sustainable, which is always important because let's let's be honest, we don't have DuPonts uh, in, the, in the family history here uh, funding the garden. So we need to be wise about what we do. So we're excited to have Amy kind of bring her take on some uh, sustainable gardening practices. So with that being said, we're gonna try to make that next transition when she shares screen and everything. Fingers mm -hmm. crossed, everything goes smooth. Yeah. Hopefully it will. So thank you everybody for coming. Um, those at home on Zoom as well as in person, it's nice to actually see people again um, and not have it all online. So, um, but yeah, I'm gonna talk about ways we can, um, small things we can do in our gardens to be a little bit more sustainable. Um, and I'm not an expert. I don't claim to be an expert. And it's not that everything I'm gonna talk about we practice here at Renolda Gardens. We do a lot of it, but you know, uh, what I'm gonna talk about is mainly um, focused on the home garden. So keep that in mind as we go. Um, and what I've done is prepared a PowerPoint. So I'm gonna to try to share my screen. So I'm assuming everybody at home can see that as well. John, would that be a? No. Yes. No. That'd be no. a no. That would okay. be a no. All right. Give us just a second. We'll work out the kinks. So what? Let's go ahead and back out. Okay. And go back. Go to share screen. Screen two. Yeah. Right. So go ahead and. Um... Go ahead and open, go back to your PowerPoint. Go to share or present show. Presenter from beginning. From beginning. And then. Minimize that. Yeah, so we can go to share screen. Okay. Right there. Mm. Let's, let's, That's what we did yesterday. Okay, let's try it. See what happens. Yes, that worked. Yay. Okay, so now just pull up your PowerPoint. No. Oh, got it. That's that it. one. Okay. Yes. Well, we can still see it. Yes. Okay. I think we're good. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you guys for being patient. All right. I'm going to minimize that. Okay. All right. So 
anyway, sustainability in the home garden. So um, what I'm gonna talk about, I'm gonna cover four main points um, that I think really can help us learn how to take these small steps. Um, and I love this picture right here um, that I chose just because like with the timbers, the natural timbers that they've used is a great way to reuse something to define raised beds. Um, they're growing edible stuff in there. They're using um, bamboo stakes that are um, biodegradable. So stuff like that. So first of all, why, why is it important that we do this? Um, it's important for you know the health and future of our planet. Climate change is a real thing. Um, we need to um, we need to learn how to um, work with our natural resources and problems that we may have in our garden to um, to teach our kids you know to have better habits. Um, and these small steps really do um, lead to great strides. A lot of people think that, you know, there's nothing they can do to help the, you know, the big picture, but I think we should always be positive. <laughs> um, but how we garden really can improve the health of our neighborhood, our community, city, and planet. So the four steps that I have pinpointed include water, soil, plants, and practices. Um, I'm gonna start by talking about water. Um, when we think about water and sustainability, we need to think about um, how we use water and how water, storm water especially, might affect our gardens and our properties. Um, in our neck of the woods in the Mid-Atlantic, we don't really, um, we don't appreciate the value of water as much as they do in other parts of the country and other parts of the world, maybe. Um, take out West, for example, in California, you know, people might have restrictions on how much water they can use um, in their gardens or to water their lawns or to wash their cars, um, things like that. So, um, so here um, we just, I don't think we value it as, not, as, as much as we should. Um, we need to think of it as a finite resource. Um, one important thing is to observe how water flows through and affects your garden, um, whether that is um, storm water or, you know, when you're out watering your garden, if, if you see that you have um, poor soil that might not um, perk as well, you know, you might be losing a, water, a lot of the water that you're, that you're watering your tomatoes with if it just runs off. So, and, and when we get a big rain, it's nice to watch, you know, how that water runs through your yard. Does it pool in certain places? Um, does it flood certain parts of your yard? You know, things like that. Um, and it's really important that we learn to work with water instead of against it, because water is a really powerful force and we can't, you know, change the slope of our land very easily. So we might as well, you know, learn to build rain gardens and things like that. So rain barrels are one thing that we can do, um, a very easy way that we can, um, that we can capture rainwater and um, use it to water certain parts of our gardens. Um, rain barrels are pretty inexpensive. You can usually get one sometimes for free through the extension office or at a lower price through the extension office. Um, or they can usually be purchased for probably under $100. So a thousand square foot roof, which isn't very big, um, can shed 625 gallons of water from a one inch rainfall. That's a lot of water. So that's more than, you know, you can capture in probably, you know, if you have even multiple rain barrels, more than you can hold. But um, so every, every bit of that water that you capture, you're able to use it to water, um, fill up watering cans or to water your beds nearby or to use a soaker hose um, to water nearby beds. Um, and so I'm gonna hammer this over and over and over again, but collecting rainwater is one way that you can help take the pressure off of the local watershed. So um, during big rain events, um, you know, all the water from the imperme impermeable surfaces, um, pay, uh, driveways, streets, uh, roofs, things like that, it just rushes water into the storm drains and into our watersheds and, you know, creates flooding problems down, down here at Bethabra Park or Silas Creek or Muddy Creek or wherever. 
um, but that that watershed can only handle so much at one time. So even if it's you know 55 gallons at a time, you know that's that's a small step that we can take take for the sustainable aspect of of mitigating that that rainfall. My slides want to jump sometimes, so if they start jumping too much, tell me. So. This is a picture of the rain barrel that I have at my house. So with a rain barrel, you always want to elevate it a little bit to get a little bit of gravity feed on it. Um, so this middle picture shows you where it's sited at my house. It's on a steep downhill slope. So that's enough gravity for me to feed the water out of it. Um, it's got a small um, spigot on the bottom and another spigot on the side. Um, this is more decorative, you know, um, my husband gave it to me for my birthday um, and it's pretty and I like it, but it's very, very functional as well. I think it's a 55 gallon um, tank is what it holds. But just to show you in this third picture over here, that small little piece of gutter, um, it might be three feet long, but it, it utilizes just that small little overhang on the side of the covered porch to dump into the rain barrel. and a half inch to an inch rainfall fills that barrel up like that. So, um, but if it was up to me, I would have three rain barrels on our house, but it's in the works. It's small steps, right? So a rain garden is another very sustainable way to think or to use water um, in your home garden. Um, rain gardens, if you'll watch during a heavy rain event, um, watch where the water wants to go. Um, you know, where is it funneling itself? Where is it dumping to? Where is it collecting? Where do you have a soggy spot in your yard? Um, and work with it, you know? Um, in this case, I love this picture because it shows that depression where they've made a rain garden and they also have a couple of outlets uh, for overflow if the rain gets too, um, too heavy in it. Um, but rain gardens are a great opportunity to use plants that you normally wouldn't get a chance to plant. Um, there's tons of different grasses and sedges, um, um, shrubs that like wet feet, um, red twigs, yellow twig dogwood, itea, things like that. Um, but rain gardens are just a, a sustainable way to work with any kind of water problem you're having um, on your property. Um, and once again, it, it's helping take the, the pressure off of the local watershed. And they can be really aesthetically pleasing too. They can be a beautiful, beautiful um, attribute to your garden. So another way to um, be more sustainable with water is to mend your hoses. This is pretty self-explanatory. Um, we've all had a leaky hose. We've probably kicked it and cursed it and, you know, walked it to the trash can. Um, I've been tempted to do that many times, um, but you can easily mend them, the male and female ends, um, or you know, simple clamps, you know, snipping off a bad section and mending it back together. Um, and if mending isn't an option, you know, think of other things you can do with you know, pieces of garden hose, um, make new handles, tool sheets, stuff like that. So, um, more sustainable things when it comes to stormwater management on our property. And we can look, to, we can look at things like this, bioretention, um, bioswales and vegetative swales. Um, we see this a lot in a city setting and municipalities. Um, the Department of Transportation does this kind of stuff all the time off of exit ramps, you know, where they mitigate the water and channel it in certain ways that are a little bit more eco-friendly. So um, these two pictures illustrate that. Um, they're both vegetative swales. One's off of a parking lot, one is off of a city street. Um, you don't see these as much um, in the home garden as you do in situations like this, but I speak from experience because at my house, we have a vegetative swale that we installed probably three or four years ago because we've got a huge storm culvert that dumps water onto our property. So after working tirelessly with the city um, and trying to find solutions through extension um, and the soil and water um, division, we realized that we, there wasn't anybody that would 
really help us with it. We had to figure out a solution ourselves. They had lots of suggestions, but you know, we needed to do the work. So we installed um, a vegetated swale and it was just a matter of light grading to make the, sw the belly, the swale out a little bit. And we intensively planted it with um, sedges, native grasses, um, and all different kinds of, you know, drought tolerant shrubs. So changing how we water is also very sustainable. Soaker hoses are always gonna be more efficient than sprinklers. Um, they're gonna direct the water right to the roots um, of plants. You get a lot of evaporation loss when you use sprinklers, keep that in mind. Um, and you have the confidence of knowing that if you're out there for 30 minutes or an hour, you know, you're getting the most, you know, out of what you're doing if you're doing it smarter. Knowing when to water is a sustainable practice as well. Um, most of us in here are probably gardeners. So you know that watering early morning or late evening in the summertime, especially when we need to be watering more is way more effective than watering in the hot part of the day. So, and mulch. Mulch is so important when it comes to um, helping, you know, water work for you. It's going to help retain a lot of moisture around your plants and your beds. Um, you can't get enough mulch. Choosing drought tolerant plants is also a great choice um, for water conservation. Um, once they're established, you just, they take care of themselves. So you don't need to fuss over them and baby, baby them. All right. The second step um, to sustainable, a sustainable garden would be soil. So, um, okay. What do you think about rubber mulch? I've never used rubber mulch. Um, and to be honest with you, I haven't had a lot of feedback on it. Um, I, it's probably a good way to recy recycle. I mean, what are they using old tires, shredded up tires? But I don't know about moisture retention with rubber mulch. Um, I haven't done any research on it, but does anybody in here have any experience? Just that most rubber products are made out of the petroleum based mm -hmm. so that when they do break down, it's not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 That makes perfect sense. And will they even break down? Yeah. Um, well, what she was saying, if y'all couldn't hear, is um, it's a petroleum based, the rubber is a petroleum based product. And so it could leach, you know, harmful things back into the soil. So I think there's also concern about you know, heavy metals that the, that the tires are picking up on mm -hmm. the roads, off the disc, you know, brake discs and things like that. Mm -hmm. So I think it's something to research, mm -hmm. but. Yeah, and I'm, now that you've mentioned it, that's a good point. I'm gonna do my homework on it too, because I need to know. I don't use it, but I've never considered using it, but I need to know more about it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is that the only question right now? Okay. Um, so the next, um, Thing we can do for a more sustainable garden is to think about our soil and what we do to and for our soil. Um, we always want to be building up our soil. Keep that in mind. Um, whether it's <clears throat> compost that you make yourself, whether it's bringing in <clears throat> composted cow manure or you know leaf mulch or you know, whatever you're going to be using, um, you always want to be building that up. Um, Erosion is always going to be your enemy. And if you're building up, you're going to have less problems with that. Um, compost, if you don't already compost, that is the number one thing that I would recommend if you're trying to be more sustainable in your home garden is to start composting. Um, it's so helpful in tons of different ways. Reconsider your tilling practices. Rotate your crops. Uh, consider cover crops during idle periods and consider switching to organic fertilizers. So I'm gonna talk about compost for a minute. So compost, um, it's gonna reduce your footprint in numerous ways. Um, and plus it's just gonna make, you know, good rich 
soil essentially for you to put back in your garden. So I'm gonna talk about this a lot about closing the loop. So when we talk about sustainability and closing the loop, um, think of your yard as its own little ecosystem. Um, and the less things that we can bring in, bring into our garden and the less things that we take out, um, you know, the smaller footprint we have. Um, so if we can, you know, plant a vegetable garden and when it's done, you know, compost all, all those, that plant material and save the seeds from our garden and replant it the next year, you know, you can see how that loop is, is closing up there. Um, and we, we can find compost, compostable things all over from the inside, from our kitchens to our gardens to, you know, a fallen tree. So we can, we can always find the layers to put in there. And I like to think of composting as a lazy gardening habit because you're essentially just piling something up and walking away. And, you know, that's, that's pretty easy if you ask me. Um, and, it, and composting kitchen, kitchen scraps will drastically cut down um, on your household trash that you take out every week. I know it does for me and my husband at home. Um, that coupled with the recycling, you'll be really surprised with how how that drops. So um, there's different ways to set up a compost, home compost system. This three bin compost system is very common. Um, I think it's really, really good for community gardens or shared spaces, or if you have kids, because it's an easy way for them to see the process. Um, but essentially the three bin system, um, in the first one, you're gonna have all your raw stuff, all your kitchen scraps, all your, your twigs, all your garden, you know, um, organic stuff. And after that heats up and starts to kind of cook, you're gonna turn it over to your middle bin where it's gonna to continue to break down. Um, and then your third bin is your, gonna be your finished product um, where you can, you know, use that to spread in your beds, you know using pots, whatever, however you want to use them. But it's a really good design. There's tons of different ways to build these things um, and they're easy to use. These prefabricated bins are awesome. I have on the left over here, um, this earth machine. I have one of those at home. I got it from the extension agency several years ago. Um, and they're great. It sits out by my um, recycling bin and trash bin. And so when I go to take out my recycling, um, I just take out my kitchen caddy, my compost caddy and dump it right in there. It's, you know, it's very handy. And I think that's the key to composting, especially from your kitchen is to make it as easy as possible for yourself. Um, but yeah, the earth machine over here, um, it's got a locking lid. It's, it's vented almost I'm, I'm sure all prefabricated compost bins are vented, but, um, but I have to turn this and I turn it probably once every 10 days or so, more so in the summer when it's really hot. Um, but as we're the one on the right-hand side is a tumbler and you can just spin it and it turns itself. <clears throat> you can also choose to have a compost heap or a pile. Um, and I have both, the earth machine here and the pile as well. Um, I have a lot of trees, um, large mature trees on my property. And so I use my compost pile for twigs and for sticks, not very big you know, branches by any means, but you know, any of my twiggy stuff I put in there, lots of leaves go in there. Um, and all the um, stuff I take out of my vegetable garden gets piled on there as well. So keep in mind that these are slower, you know, you, you have to work a little harder to turn these kinds of things. Uh, but some people just keep a compost pile to have, um, you know, to help close that loop instead of putting it on the curb for the city to pick up or having a yard waste cart. I think that's what they're called. So lead the leaves. We've all heard, um, heard about this sustainable practice. Um, and there's a, I do it. Um, I've been doing it for several years. Um, as long as you do it right and do it, you know, do it properly, it's beneficial all the way around. Uh, leaves are free mulch. I mean, that's the bottom line. Um, and so in all my natural areas, 
um, I direct and rake all the leaves over to those sections of the yard um, where we are able to um, mulch them with the mower and bag them. Those all get dumped in the beds um, and they get dumped in the compost pile as well and get scattered in our vegetable garden beds. So we, we leave the leaves wherever we can. Keep in mind, leave the leaves doesn't mean you sit on your porch and you watch the leaves fall and you wait you know, till springtime and you're like, oh, <laughs> you know, this must be how it's done. Um, you can't leave piles of wet leaves piled up on your lawn because um, it's gonna smother your grass, it's gonna kill it. Um, but if we, if we utilize that leaf mulch responsibly, that's, that's what we, we're looking for here. And beneficial insects, um, it's very important for them to overwinter in the leaf mulch. Um, Luna moths, butterflies, spiders, beetles, all sorts of beautiful and you know, creepy insects, you know, <laughs> they, they need that you know, to, uh, to reproduce and to overwinter. And once again, when you leave the leaves, you help close that loop. Another way we can um, have a more sustainable garden with our soil is to rethink your fertilizers. Synthetic fertilizers feed the plant where organic fertilizers feed the plant and the soil. Um, you know, synthetic fertilizers like 10, 10, 10, it's like a shot in the arm for a plant. It's like, it's quick growth. It's, um, it's quick, it's, you know, it, it gets it going but it doesn't do anything to feed the soil underneath. So if we're using organic fertilizers and compost, um, not only are we giving a boost to the plants, um, but we're feeding that soil, which is gonna give a boost to the plants. Um, especially in commercial farms, you know, you can get a lot of runoff from synthetic fertilizers as well, which can dump right into our watersheds. Then over time, you'll find that if you continuously use organic fertilizers, um, that it helps feed the health of the soil so much that you, you won't even need, you won't even really need chemical fertilizers anymore. Cover crops are also a great thing that you can do for your soil. Um, during idle times, during the winter, you know, if you're not going to be using your raised beds, um, help your soil replenish itself by planting a cover crop. Um, cover crops are going to um, cut down on erosion. Um, if they're going to suppress weeds, because we even weeds can grow um, during the winter time, helps to fix the nitrogen in the soil, and it adds they add organic material back into the soil, and um, green. Green manures, as you know, some cover crops are, can be tilled under, and that just adds more organic material back in. And plus, it provides shelter for beneficial insects. So there's a whole school of thought on no-till gardens, um, and I do not practice it at home. You know, we don't till our garden every year, but we have a tiller and we use it. Um, but there's a lot to be said about the no-till methods. Um, when you use um, a mechanical tiller, the, those spinning tines are, are disturbing the microorganisms in the soil. And um, if, if you can find a way with broad forks, like what is pictured here, or different kinds of tools or different methods of working your soil, instead of using a tiller, um, it, it's beneficial to the health of the soil. And once again, by building up our soil with composts and leaf mulch and things like that, that, that helps to, to build up the soil as well. Once again, mulch, um, just as it's important um, to hold in moisture, mulch is also important um, for the health of our soil. So um, don't, don't forget about that. So the third step to a sustainable garden is plant choice. Um, plant choice really does matter. Um, as I touched on before, drought resistant plants are always good options because you don't, you know, you don't have to baby them as much. Um, native plants, also a wonderful thing that, you know, is driven home all the time, plant more natives. Um, plant from pollinators, it goes hand in hand with natives 
responsible tree planting is important. Um, keeping exotic plants in check. Um, we don't think about that a lot, um, whether, whether they're existing in our garden or on our property, or we are buying, you know, um, exotic plants non-native plants, um, just keep them in check, you know, know if they're bullies, if they're going to reseed aggressively and, um, and just don't let them, you know, do their thing. Um, and incorporate edibles. That is a really good way to be more sustainable in the garden. So there's tons of different reasons to choose native plants. Um, but the bottom line is they're easy. They're this, this is where they grow. This is what they like. So if I can plant a beautiful garden and they not be fussy and fight back, you know, every step of the way, I'm all about it. Um, they're great for, um, for native pollinators. They feed fuel and house a wide range of insects. Um, they support native wildlife. And I will admit fully that I'm not a native purist by any means. Um, I was in the nursery industry way too long. Um, and know that there's way too many good plants out there that are non-native to be a purist. But, um, but I am a strong proponent of encouraging people to plant natives all the time. Um, it's important for so many reasons. But um, if you're gonna you know, in, put in a new pollinator bed, let's just say, and it's full of native plants, um, if you're gonna, if you take a butterfly, if you plant a butterfly bush in the middle of all those natives, you know, I can guarantee you're going to have just as much insect activity on that one plant as you would other plants. So just keep that in mind. So when you choose your plants, make sure to plant for pollinators. Um, stagger your planting so that you have um, nectar rich food early, mid, and late. So in early spring when the honeybees, you know, need, are waking up and need to, um, to have some food, you've got your penstemon or columbine, you know, those early things that, that you can provide for them. And then the late season plants are really important as well. You know, you have migrating monarchs mid, mid um, fall. So they need, they need a little bit of help on their way down south. Um, Pollinators need water source. Keep that in mind. I don't, I don't think everybody has a water feature or a bird bath, but it's not just the birds that are using that. You know, it's, it's bees and, and ticks as well. Um, and when you plant for pollinators, you know, go out and hike and look at natural areas and parks and come to Renolda Gardens and see, you know, which plants are just on fire with insects because, um, just observing things in nature can really help you see what you can and should maybe plant or add into your garden. And of course, when we talk about being sustainable with plants, we have to think about the monarch butterflies. We have to feed them. Um, they are milkweed um, specialists, of course. So those caterpillars need the milkweed um, in, order, in order to survive. Milkweed is in decline, as we know, because of development mainly. Um, and there's tons of different milkweeds to choose from. These that I've listed here are all um, native milkweeds and that can add a lot of diversity um, into your garden instead of just planting the common milkweed. So I think this is a really um, good point as well. And um, I don't think everybody thinks about this all the time. But responsible tree planting is incredibly important. Um, so many times we, we see trees planted um, in the wrong place. So when I say that, I'm talking about utility lines and maybe too close to the house, um, too close to the neighbor's property, things like that. Um, but we, we have to remember to plant the right tree in the right place. Um, planting native species like oaks and um, cherries and things like that um, really help support the food chain in terms of insects and birds. Um, so if you're able to plant a large tree, you know, always, I would always encourage you to plant a native tree over, you know, an ornamental tree if you have the luxury of that space. 
um, always plant properly. You know, I think that um, a lot of people don't use proper planting practices. The root flare is not taken into consideration a lot of the time. So make sure you're doing that good. Um, and of course, planting trees um, adjacent to our homes can help with heating and cooling, um, lowering our energy use. That's always a sustainable practice. Um, and we wanna always plan for the future. You know, if I plant a, a white oak tomorrow, I'm not gonna see that tree, you know, mature, but um, it's not about me, you know, it's about, it's about the future generations, it's about our urban canopy, so on and so forth. This chart I thought was very good because it shows um, suggested um, planting distances. And I can't stress the utilities enough. Um, we all see it happen every day um, in the city limits, especially. Um, this right here. Um, it's unfortunate, you know, you don't want to ever see stuff like this. Um, but, um, you know, if, if we avoid planting trees where we shouldn't, um, we won't have, at least in our own yards, we don't have to deal with that. So. Plant the right tree in the right place. Edible landscaping. Um, this is a great way to incorporate um, sustainability practices into your garden. Um, of course, when we grow more ourselves, we're helping to close the loop. We make fewer trips to the grocery store. Um, we're able to share um, you know, heavy harvests of things with our neighbors and friends. Um, and plus, you know, it's good for our health. We're eating nutritious food. We know where our food comes from. So another step to a more sustainable garden are um, practices, the little things that we can do every single day when we're out and about in our gardens to, um, to be a little bit more green. So saving seeds is important. Um, I don't think we do that as much as we should. I know that I don't. Um, I've got probably two or three different kinds of seeds that I reliably save at home. But um, there's a lot of things that we plant though, you know, that, that are hybrids that we can't really save the seeds of and expect it to, to be true. Um, but the things that we can are open pollinated seeds, our heirloom seeds, things like that. Um, it's always good to save those. Um, and we can always share this with our neighbors, with our other gardeners. Um, we can participate in our organized local seed swaps. Um, of course, Old Salem hosted a seed swap for a long time. And I don't, since COVID, I don't know, I don't think they've been doing it. Okay, so uh, Paul J. Senior Garden might be starting up a seed swap. Um, maybe, I mean, even one day we'll look into doing something like that here because I think it's a, as a community of gardeners, that's something that we appreciate and rely on each other for stuff like that. So shrinking your lawn is a great way to be more sustainable. Um, and you don't have to go big or go home on that aspect. Just, um, you know, if you have a huge lawn, um, even taking a small section of that and naturalizing it into a mulched area or a, a shade garden or a sunny pollinator bed or a, um, a sitting area, anything to reduce the size of your lawn is gonna be um, less lawn to mow, less lawn to maintain. Um, lawns are probably the most unsustainable thing that, that we can have um, in our home gardens. Um, and I, I love a good patch of green grass. I mean, I do, I, I love it. Um, I'll, I actually love to mow. Don't tell anybody I said that, but I do. It's so calming, but, um, but I mean, there's nothing sustainable about a lawn. You're watering a lawn, um, you're using all sorts of fertilizers and chemicals to help make it green and stay green. Um, you're mowing it all the time. So you've got, you know, the, power equipment, um, pollution. So the smaller we can get our lawns, the, the more sustainable we're being. 
We can repair our garden tools. Winter is a fantastic time to take the time to do that. Um, it gets us out of the house. It gives us a chance where we're not so busy in our gardens um, to do stuff like that. Sharpening tools, sharpening pruners, um, you know, fixing tires. Um, I know that come winter, you know, here at Renolda, we're going to have, you know, plenty of chores to do on, on our whole arsenal out there. So um, repairing a garden tool is cheaper and more sustainable than going out and buying something new. You can recycle nursery plastics. And before you go and recycle them, you can reuse them and you can reuse them and you can use them again. So um, I always like to um, hammer home that you can use them until they crack or break and they just have no use less left in them at all. Um, you can use them to start seeds, stick cuttings, pot up um, divided perennials, all sorts of stuff. Um, but when you're ready to recycle them, keep in mind that say if you live in the city of Winston-Salem, you can't put them in your recycling bin. They don't accept them. It's only contaminating the other recyclables. Um, but we have a great source over at the Piedmont Triad Farmer's Market where you can recycle them. Um, I don't know if y'all are familiar with, with that market, but if you, go, if you go over there in between the market buildings and the Moose Cafe, there's a driveway that goes in between the two and it takes you right to this, the recycling drop-off. Um, and what they do is there's a recycling center down in Burlington or Ashboro, excuse me, Ashboro, I think is where a company collects all of the drop-offs and takes them down there to recycle them. So um, it's a great thing for you to do for your neighbors too. If you're going, you might as well load up theirs and go as well. You know, one trip is better than three. Permeable pavers are another practice. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's not just something you can do lickety split, but um, if you can do a permeable paver driveway instead of um, an asphalt driveway, that's less um, water runoff that you'll have. Um, and it, they help to, to filter out some pollutants that maybe our cars, um, you know, put out and that might end up in our watershed. You can um, use organic pest and lawn management practices. And when I'm talking about that, I'm talking about sprays, um, pesticides, insecticides, um, fungicides, things like that. Um, there's always going to be a organic or natural option instead of using chemicals. Um, and, if, and before you decide to spray any pest in your garden, you should always um, figure out if it's even a pest or if it's a beneficial insect. Um, lace wings might be scary and big and, you know, creepy, but at the same time, they're eating aphids off of your, off of your plants. So they're a good one to have around. Um, Companion planting um, can help curb pests. And one thing that uh, people don't think about as much, um, if, if you practice good hygiene and housekeeping, um, you can help uh, keep disease at bay. So if you sanitize your pruners more often or thin um, like mildew prone plants, like garden flocks, things like that, um, by, by keeping up on that, you can cut down on the disease um, and therefore eliminate spraying. Better weed management, we can always go and pick up that bottle of Roundup because it works so well, um, but there are other ways. Um, and I think that when it comes to weed control, I think that we need to, I think we do need to get better. I need to get better at home because, um, I could, I could probably pull a lot more weeds than I do without my husband going, you know, straight for the bottle of Roundup. But um, anyway, um, but hand weeding, you know, it is what it is. Some days are better than others. If you've got a good breeze, you know, you can get out there and enjoy it for what it's worth. Um, scuffle hose, it's a great tool. John knows I'm, I'm a big fan of the scuffle hoe. Um, but that's great for using in between your rows. Um, weed torches that are pictured here. 
I've used one one time and it was very fun um, and, and it got the job done. <laughs> um, and I've talked to a lot of um, a lot of landscapers that use that regularly in certain areas. Um, so that's an option. Um, acetic acid, which is vinegar and dish soap. It works, it does, I've tried it. Um, you just have to be persistent. Um, you have probably have to spray twice as much as you would if you used a chemical. Um, but keep in mind, just because it's organic doesn't mean that it can't you know, be harmful in some ways. Like if you get this acetic acid is eight, usually 18 to 20% um, concentrate. And so it can burn your skin if you get it on you. So just be careful with these things as well. Um, but anyway, hand weeding, like I said, it's some, some days it's more fun than others, um, but it's always a sustainable way to pull, to, to weed your garden. And, you know, um, think about prevention, ground cloths, organic corn gluten, pre-emergence, um, mulch, once again, um, those are all ways to prevent weeds before they start, but we're always going to have weeds. So it's just, it's like death and taxes, right? We can also reduce our outdoor power equipment use. Um, blowers, mowers, weed eaters, you know, anything that works on gasoline and oil. Um, I like to think, I, I, I don't think I can ever not have that mower at my house. I can never switch to a real mower per se because my um, yard's a little bit too big. But um, I could definitely use it less. You know, I could, I could not mow as much as I do. So even reducing the amount of um, fre the frequency that we, that we use this equipment, you know, is a small step. Landscape lighting isn't something we normally think about um, when it comes to being more sustainable, but um, it's something that we can do. Um, Low voltage and LED options are, are our best bets um, if we're going to have it. Solar lighting is even better, if you ask me. But, um, but solar lighting really has come a long way um, in terms of um, what's available and, and how it works and how, um, you know, the brightness of it and things like that. And, you know, you, if, if, you, if you have uh, landscape lighting, only use it when you need it. You know, a lot of those systems are on timers. Um, but do we really need, you know, our front yard lit up on a Tuesday night? You know, I mean, I don't know. So rethinking those sorts of things are important. Um, and the light pollution, I've heard a lot of heard from a lot of people that say, you know, the light pollution from landscape lighting um, can be harmful to insects and wildlife. Those nocturnal um, habits are kind of disrupted. And once again, leave the leaves. That's another practice that we can, we can always get on board with. Um, and we need to remember to use what we have. Um, every time I go to throw something away or in the recycling bin, I always question, you know, if this is good to use um, in the garden or good to use, you know, to reuse it in a different way. So. Um, retraining our brain um, to think that way is always handy. Um, we can use glass jars for so many reasons as these pictures, you know, illustrate these little projects we can do. Um, but I use a lot of glass jars for storing seeds, um, like my um, granular fertilizers. Um, I've got a couple of jars that I have dust in, like um, I use BT, which is a... Um, an organic, you know, insecticide. Um, but I've got a spaghetti jar and I just punched holes in the top. And that's what I go out and sprinkle my cabbage plants with. Um, so it's better than going out and buying like a, a device that dusts your plant for you. Um, but yeah, you can reuse your plant markers time and time again, um, layer cardboard and newspaper in your gardens for um, weed control, uh, kitty litter bins, um, at home and at work, we use kitty litter bins for lots of different things. Um, I use them at home to store soil um, under my potting bench. 
So to kind of finish up, um, I want to just hammer home that any garden can become a sustainable garden um, in so many different ways. Um, you just really, at the bottom line, I think is you need to change how you look at things and you need to be willing to change the habits that you have. Um, just like anything in our lives, if we're, um, you know, if, if, if we're trying to kick a habit or, um, you know, go on a diet, we're, we're going to have to change a few things if we want to see results. So it's the same thing um, with sustainability at home in your garden, just, you know, change little things like this, get into the habit, see things from a different perspective. And that really, really helps. Um, learn to be cheap, <laughs> you know, reuse those things, you know, um, consider your water bill, you know, um, if you're okay with paying a hundred dollars a month, think about wouldn't it be that much nicer to, to lower it even, even more. So, um, um, listen to your garden and observe the patterns. Um, like, like I was mentioning with, with water flow in, in your yard, um, just observe things and take the time to see, um, to see where your garden wants to be, you know, and find ways to, to work with that. Um, like I said earlier, you don't need to go big or go home. You can make small changes that are beneficial and that all add up, you know, for the big picture. Um, and above all, we should probably learn to appreciate nature and invite it into our gardens. Um, don't look at insects, you know, chewing the leaves of your plant as a bad thing, you know, they're there because that's, that's where they function. That's where they live. And um, we wouldn't, you know, grow a garden unless we wanted to be part of that natural world. So anyway, I hope that those steps gave you some ideas about what to do in your home garden. Um, they're all little steps, but they add up. Did we have any questions? Sure. I'm trying. Always fun trying to figure out all this stuff. All right. Hang on just a second, guys. All right. Don't know how to maximize or. We're trying to figure out how to stop sharing screen, but you can probably still hear us. Um, you know, that, as Amy said, it's always small steps lead to bigger, bigger things. Um, it's you know, I can speak. You know, diets don't don't go don't go try to change the world in your garden. Just do little steps, and it's those little things add up to bigger things. Um, you know, next week we will have a. And Dennis Wiggins is going to speak about mushrooms, and I think he's got a beverage that he actually makes from mushrooms. Um, and it's supposed to be, it's, it's good. Um, at first, when I thought about a mushroom flavored beverage, that kind of made me cringe, but um, he's come up with something that's uh, apparently quite tasty. But, uh, you know, I'm always envious of the people that can go out into the woods and come back with, you know, where the chicken of the woods and all these things where. You know, I always joke of how do, how do you know which is the mushroom that you can eat, not the one that either kills you or makes you see God. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, but, you know, that's, that's half the fun is, is it's always a, a kind of a learning journey for all of us. Uh, little things. That's one of the great things about gardening is we can pick something up from everyone. Um, and well, at least it's a good photo of seeing. It's better, <laughs> it's better than looking at me. Uh, but you know, we thank everyone for their support on, you know, following our gardening series and being supporters of the gardens and uh, just be ready because there's going to be a lot of activity picking up in the next month or so. Uh, Long Coliseum Drive, you'll see some activity as we finally get our water tap, which will allow us to start doing plantings out along the trails where we killed all the invasives and mowed them back. Uh, we didn't want to plant until we had water, which is kind of ties into sustainability. What's the point of going out and planting them if you can't water them? Um, so, you know, getting a water source because we can't keep hauling a tank of water back and forth up there. 
but that'll start happening. Uh, you may see Asplund out there finally finishing the job on the trees that have been butchered for over years. We're gonna take those trees out along underneath the power lines. And then we're gonna step back out of their easement and replant. Um, so we've got a lot of big plans for along Coliseum Drive where the trails are there. So that, that's, gonna, that's exciting for me to see that start happening. Um, you know, now that prices have stabilized on lumber and it's not like I'm gonna have a million dollar boardwalk out there. Um, <laughs> But yeah, you know, we're thankful. Like we had, we had some great donors. Uh, the Ecology Wildlife uh, Fund was one of the key donors to get this boardwalk going. So um, keep 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 an eye out for what's getting ready to start happening uh, in no, late in mid to late November. You'll see some things start happening in the formal garden as well. So with that being said, we thank everyone Wait, for your attention. Have... Yes. Okay, a couple of questions. Um, I, I my mom and I were talking about uh, weeds and controlling them. And I wondered about cream, mm -hmm. you know, where you sprinkle mm -hmm. it out and it keeps seeds from, mm -hmm. from germinating all that. Is that, I mean, I try not to use a lot of um, chemicals in my garden, mm -hmm. but is that something that's safe or is that something to avoid or? It's not organic. Um, yeah, it's not organic. Preen makes, makes an organic corn gluten-based pre-emergent. Um, so you might look into that, but a normal preen pre-emergent is, um, what's the active ingredient in preen? Oh Lord, I don't know. I've been out of retail for a garden center for a long time. Um, but basically preen, will, it, it forms a film on the, on the soil layer that when seedlings start germinating, when they hit that layer, it kills them. And I think it's the same basic function as the corn gluten. It is. Basically, it is. You know, it's just a different, different, you know, method to do it. Do they sell that at the home center as well as the regular yellow jug? Mm -hmm. They used to, and it used to come in the yellow jug as well. Sometimes I'll put it in a bag, but Preen is a brand name that makes a corn gluten based one. Yeah. And my second question: um, We talk about invasives, and we live in the woods. Some of our neighbors and mm -hmm. guilty as charged planted English ivy as a ground cover. What's it take to get rid of that? Persistence. Yeah, a lot of persistence. So one of the things I tell people to do, like we will mow it to the ground. Um, the trick is, and, and we use Roundup and, and glyphosate because it works. And it's actually, it's a huge tool in native plant restoration. Um, you know, despite all the demonization of it, it's actually one of the least harmful chemicals around. You know, once that's gone, the next step is not as, you know, impact, you know, you know negative impact. So I just want to throw that out there. But with English ivy, when it has that new growth and it's got that, you know, telly green kind of look, it hasn't built up a wax layer on that leaf. So it's easier for glyphosate or any wheat, any herbicide to get into it. It's when it gets that nice dull dark green, it's got a wax layer on it that it's harder to get into. So it's something that mow it, you know, either hit it right at spring when it leaps out, that'll knock it back. Then, you know, come back when it leaps, when it, you know, says, okay, you know, okay, you, you may have won this round, I'm coming back, hit it again. And it takes several it's successive like, things to knock it back. That? Another thing that I tell people, look for where it's gone up trees. It has an interesting growth history where when it's horizontal, it's juvenile. When it goes up trees, it changes to an adult and that's when it flowers and fruits and the birds, you know, it's a, it, you know, the birds eat, eat it and then they poop it out and then you've got another English eye. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it does, um, it take, yeah. Um, so what I would recommend, mm -hmm. and, and this is the thing is where you don't get ahead of yourself. And this is where it's kind of like start small. If, if I were to go out here, if I had the, the capability to remove all the English ivy like that, I have a gigantic vacuum out there. And we all know nature does not like that. And the first so thing that's gonna come back in is going to be invasives. So it's tackle a certain area, get the ivy out, replant it, you know, use some of these native native sedges that we talked about last week, things that cover the ground, you know, and it's, you know, pick, pick a, a number of different things. And then once that's established, move on to your next section. So, you know, only bite off as much as you can chew. Uh, that's the thing.
uh, because it is a straw. Isn't that what the idea is that when it grows up the tree? I mean, we've kind of tried to cut it back so that it doesn't harm the tree. It will harm yeah. the trees eventually, right? It, it can over, if it overtakes the canopy of the tree, that's respect well, turn on but the also, projector? you know, in winter, it's additional surface area, you get an ice storm, you know, that happens. Um, so it's, it's, it's one of those things that what the best thing when it starts on a tree is cut it down low at the base. And if you get a little squirt bottle, squirt that raw cut with some, with some Roundup um, and that will help knock it back. Um, there was a huge amount on one of the big bald cypresses out by Coliseum Drive. We, I peeled that off, you know, the trunk. So we finally, and it's unsightly for a year or two as it start, as it dies, and then it'll, you know, eventually disappear and fall apart in pieces. Great, thank you. Anyone else? Hey, look. I can't quite see checks on my phone. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, I'm learning all the little options on the phone. Do you need to add perlite to compost or you can simply use compost out of the bin? Straight out of the bin. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's a great thing. I think, good Lord, I don't know how many years my dad has carried the coffee filters out to the compost pile. Um, you know, and that's something I should be doing. And I remember Starbucks used to offer schools, hey, we'll bring, you know, think about how much coffee grounds they have. And that was always good to, sprinkle underneath your blueberries or anything that loves acidic um, because you know coffee grounds are great for that but you don't have to add perlite perlite is is i would say somewhat artificial i wouldn't necessarily think about adding that to the soil um, so i think that should answer that question but i think that's all the questions um, the projector just barked at me uh, so I think we've got everything done. And with that being said, we'll just look towards everyone uh, for next week for talking about mushrooms. Thank y'all. Thank y'all. Thank you very much.